All right, guys, um, we've been having some audio issues, so I, I hope uh, y'all are picking me up. Uh, we're uh, we're going to try and work through it. If we have any issues, uh, we may have to postpone uh, and, and work them out. But uh, we've got a, a great guest today. Um, we've got R.T. Mains, uh, Mike, Michael Buckland, Bucky. Uh, he also flew in the Ford Drum Project uh and I, I we're we're lucky to have him here he's a great uh sf historian sog specifically and a great recon man and just an all-around great man and uh i've actually got an artifact he sent me uh uh one of his rt main or not rt main patches but one of the patches they had and this is one of my private collection that i'll uh cherish forever so uh mr mike the floor is yours sir Okay, bud. Well, thank you uh, very much. Let's see. You've got your uh, listeners tuned in and probably would like to know a little about uh, SOG. And what I thought I would do, because I have kind of a historical bent, I wanted to take a moment and sketch out where all of these things came from. Uh, I was always interested in the gray-haired SF soldiers that had taught us, mentored us, let us because uh, they were such a source of information and I would ask them things like why are we here or how did this program come to be and they had lived through a whole bunch of things uh, basically if you go back to World War II uh, usually the official history of special forces tends to be traced to or, or ascribed to the joint American Canadian first special services force in World War II and there's some certainly justification for that. But really, the heart and soul of SF is traceable to a program called OSS in World War II, the Office of Strategic Services. And at the end of World War II, that tremendously successful uh, unconventional warfare program uh, that was done in the Pacific and the European campaigns, it was then just basically thrown out because the U.S. does have a record of getting rid of what's been working well. It had to be reactivated in the Korean War in the early 1950s. And basically what was happening around the end of the Korean War, a decision was made in Washington to split the group that had come out of OSS into two different organizations. And this would be the genesis of, on the one hand, the CIA, and on the other hand, the U.S. Army Special Forces. The two programs then had separated. And for the first time, we had the CIA, and we had formalized the uh, Army Special Forces. And it helps uh, to understand from that point on, the special forces had adopted the unconventional warfare role for the military and not everyone would be necessarily familiar with UW or unconventional warfare. With conventional warfare, the idea is taking and holding ground, uh, particularly strategic ground, but traditionally militaries have wanted to hold ground especially the high ground. But in unconventional warfare, you're concerned with making war on your enemies without particularly taking and holding the ground. And so that is what Special Forces was um, designed to do. It was made up for uh, unconventional warfare, what later came to be called Special Warfare. And the next thing to understand about Special Forces, to ever really grasp what it is and what it does and always did, there's a concept called force multiplication. And that goes to the absolute heart of Special Forces, because what you're doing there is you're taking a smaller number of American unconventional warfare specialists, and you're letting them recruit and train and equip and lead in combat operations for nationals. And that way you get a terrific amount of bang for your buck. And that is what separates Special Forces from all of the other units that we, for example, there are many, um, what most people think that Special Forces was for and was about is what you call direct action. 
This is just hard strikes, kind of commando type raids. And that certainly is a major part of what Special Forces does. But there are many fine units that can do direct action. Uh, examples would be the Rangers, an outstanding group. Uh, Marines are uh, very fine uh, direct action troops. And you just use them as integral units to attack and destroy things uh, and such. But in special forces, the emphasis is almost always on raising foreign nationals under American leadership, training, etc. And where this came into uh, its own, and it was a brilliant program, as Vietnam took off, you had the 5th Special Forces Group, and it built up uh, at first, it was units from the first group on Okinawa, and they also had units from the seventh group, and there were a couple other groups that had kicked in units. Uh, the first Oka teams from the first group, Okinawa, were initially called snakebite teams. And early on, snakebite teams from Okinawa had uh, some key parts to play. Later, the fifth group was just activated for Vietnam, and it did the Vietnam War. And the most that it ever had for American SF personnel would have been approaching 2,000. I don't recall the exact number. But that, those 2,000 American Green Berets were able to raise an fighting under American leadership and command. And so uh, the fifth group had approximately 100. And they, each of the A sites, would have anywhere from several hundred up to many hundreds of uh, people, uh, sometimes approaching 1,000 at uh, some of the, uh, the big, uh, biggest of our camps. And so this was, uh, let's say, seven to eight divisions of infantry that were fighting in Vietnam under American leadership. And that was a whole bunch of Americans that didn't have to go there. So when you joined special forces, when you went through what was called the Q course, the qualification course at Fort Bragg, the special warfare center, they told you in literally the first days that you are here to learn to be teachers of the first order. If you are not interested in being a teacher, a trainer, we will not be needing you. They also um, said something else in the first few days that you never forgot, or I sure didn't. And that is, they said, you gentlemen are hoping to join the world of the U.S. Army Special Forces. We are called the Quiet Professionals. And telling everyone how good you are. Organization that ever stuff. If you are good at anything, you don't have to tell people that you are good. And they impressed that literally in the first few days that anyone who was essentially a uh, braggart, uh, anything like that, um, they didn't need you there. And that continued throughout my entire time in Special Forces uh, till I, after Vietnam, left the uh, service. That ethos of the quiet professionals, an argument that I personally consider fairly pointless or silly, people will say, well, what is the best unit? That's kind of a silly uh, question about the military because you have to ask, what is the best unit for what? The military has all kinds of exceptional people doing all kinds of interesting things. And so uh, if, you, if what you want is direct action, of course, the Navy SEALs are excellent for that. The Marines have a lot of very fine people who do good direct action. Special Forces does very good direct action. But only Special Forces does the force multiplication, teaching, training, uh, role. And that was uh, to the heart and soul of what everybody did. In SOG, we had all of these teams. SOG was tasked, more about that a little later. SOG was intended to keep 
probably 40 to 50 American SF personnel on the ground at a time in Laos and Cambodia, hammering the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But we had more than that with us of these foreign tribesmen. And of course, in general, the relationship between the American Green Berets and the Montagnard people, and prior to them, the Noongs, who were the Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, but uh, eventually reached a point. The Noongs were great fighters, but a lot of them had been essentially killed off. Some had gotten old and retired. Uh, but that relationship, that intense brotherhood between the American special forces and our yards or mountain yards, uh, the word mountain yard is French and it just means mountain person is what it means. Uh, but we call them yards and the brotherhood between American SF and the mountain yard tribes was absolutely something beautiful. And we worked, uh, of course, our teams, the American leader would be the one zero, the Montagnard leader, and there were two leaders on a team. A lot of people don't understand this. The Montagnard leader was the reverse. He was called the zero one. The assistant leader for the Americans would be the one one. The assistant leader for the Montagnards and their seniority system would be the zero one. And when it came to the overall leadership of the missions, of course, that would be American SF. But when a SOG team was operating in enemy territory, in many respects, you were deferring to the Montagnard tribesmen because these are people, they were essentially a Bronze Age culture. They grew up in the jungle and that was their life. And they were so amazingly attuned to um, just what the operating terrain was like that it would have been foolish for American SF to be trying to say what, what you did. You, the American leader would say, okay, here's the general direction we want to go to reach where we're going. He could have shown a map to the mountain yard leader, but maps didn't mean anything. Radios didn't mean anything to people in a bronze. It just by pointing in the right direction. And then the mountain yard leader would be responsible for picking the actual route. And so as you moved, let's say through Cambodia or Southern Laos, their, their uncanny ability to hear things, sometimes when you, because you're always operating in heavily patrolled areas that with they had at least hundreds of enemy infantry and very, very good infantry, but um, you couldn't hear them necessarily because heavy jungle, and a lot of this was, uh, especially in Cambodia, a double and even triple canopy uh, jungle, you couldn't hear people. Well, they could. They heard things in the jungle. So as you were moving, they could hear in many cases, if any enemy activity was out there, they would hear it. And sometimes your mountain yard leader, the point man, um, he would just, you didn't talk in that type. Everything was hand signals, but he would indicate we're about to hit a trail and give you the width of the trail. And he'd say he's hearing an enemy unit, a patrol. There's six to eight of them. They're coming from this direction and they're moving in that direction. So you could move into a well-concealed position and you could check your watch. And somewhere around eight minutes, you'd see a six to eight man NVA patrol moving down a trail. You didn't even necessarily, you hadn't seen the trail yet. But an American could not hear those things. Another example, uh, we worked in uh, SOG operations. We had some odd friends that were out there in the jungle. They were called banded crates and bamboo vipers. These are two of the most venomous snakes that exist on the face of the earth. The bamboo vipers, for example, we also called two steps. And that was because we always carried, uh, usually in the team, your upper left uh, pouch for RT Main, you always had the anti-venom for these snakes. And if someone was bitten by either a banded crate, they were quite bright and uh, I don't know quite how to put it, they had different colors, black, red, yellow, some of them. 
and the bamboo vipers were bright green. If they bit you, the reason they were called two steps is you would be dead within a matter of steps. If someone was bitten, then you had to take the venom and we didn't get bitten and you had to inject the venom fast or they were going to die. These things were so deadly. So as you're moving with absolute silence through the jungle, your mountain yard leader can, they can, it's like they can sense these deadly vipers. And what will happen, your mountain yard pointsman, he'll take the barrel of his weapon and he'll just point. He'll move, stop, he points. And then you look, and at first you don't see anything because the foliage is so lush, so bright green. Everything there is shades of green. There's about 11 to 11,000 shades of green in a place like that. But then you see it, and on the branch is this ultra-deadly bamboo viper. Could also be a banded crate. And if it strikes, you are going to die unless you're ready with the anti-venom. So what the mountain yard leader then does is move just beyond striking range of the snake. And everyone is in their steps, the, uh, the point man steps, and you move past that back onto your original trajectory. Why do you do that? Well, because we always had a lot of, or not always, but you usually had very expert tracking units and they were not likely to see those snakes. And so the snakes became your rear security by killing your trackers. That's just an example. But for an American to be able to see a snake that is just there waiting, and he's almost exactly the color. This was an example of this symbiotic relationship between the American Green Berets and the Montagnards. Uh, they were very, very good. Now, they couldn't have, they couldn't have uh, directed an airstrike uh, for anything or read a map or done some of what we would consider strategic and tactical planning. So this relationship between the uh, Green Berets and the Montagnards it not only worked brilliantly in the field, but it produced a, a deep sense of bonding and brotherhood. And the Americans would have done anything for the mountain yards. In fact, there on screen, you're looking at a picture of uh, Recon Team Maine. Uh, if you look at the back row, I'm standing there. Uh, the mountain yard tail gunner, his name was Newt. Uh, N-H-U-T, and he was, even by Montagnard uh, standards, Newt was a backwoods boy. You could tell because the Montagnards who were from very, very deep in the woods, um, they would have their front teeth filed away. And uh, so that they'd kind of speak Montagnard with a little bit of a whistling sound sometime. But that was him on the upper right, looking at the screen. Uh, that is Sherman Miller. He was a Cajun from Louisiana. As nearly as I can recall, uh, Sherman probably spoke about six words in his entire life, and uh, probably four of those when he saw one of the snakes or whatever. No, you didn't say anything then. The leader at the time is on the lower right. That's Dave Baker. Baker was a very, very gifted uh, tactical leader. He was very, very skilled. Um, uh, everyone in operations like that, you depended on each other totally. You trusted the Americans and the mountain yards. Uh, if you look over here uh, in the middle and front, uh, down here, that is that was uh, Andre. He was the interpreter. And uh, so just th the brotherhood, the, the bond that was there. What we didn't understand at the time, except for the older gray-haired SF guys, we thought that we would never, that America would never betray the people who fought with us. And we betrayed these people so completely. Um, I remember being a young SF guy on SOG, and I would talk to some of these old guys, I, I just revered them, and they taught us so many things. 
but I would be full of enthusiasm. And I, we were going to win this war. You bet we were. These people are going to be free. We are going to stop communist uh, invasion, subversion, infiltration. We are really going to produce freedom and democracy. You know, you're young and you believe this stuff. And these very experienced SF veterans, they would kind of listen to me explaining how you know i thought this was all going to work out and it kind of shake their head a little and say that's what you think is it buck hmm that's nice and it kind of walk off and i remember thinking what do these guys know that i don't know well what they knew is that the political class will always sell out what the military does. This is just simply the story. Look at the utter horror of our, it wasn't even a withdrawal from Afghanistan. It was just a shameful, it was a retreat. We promised the British and the French that we would cover their withdrawal when the time came. We didn't, we just ran away. We left, even helicopters could have been flown into Waziristan or other parts of Pakistan. We just left them there and ran away. It had nothing to do with the military. It had everything to do with the political class. So I didn't know that then, but um, the relationship between the American Green Berets and the Montagnard tribesmen was the stuff of legend. And where someone is asking, do you know what happened to the uh, indigenous after the war? Basically, we didn't get to find that out. There were, we had promised the American um, government had that the people who fought for us, we would if we left, we would take them. We violated that promise. We did nothing for them, nothing at all. We betrayed them so utterly. And what happened, the reason there's a lot of Montagnards now in the United States, uh, especially around uh, Fort Bragg, around uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina area, but also up in the Minnesota, Wisconsin area, there were a lot of them there. The U.S. government betrayed them totally. In fact, during one of the presidential administrations, we treated them as enemies because we said that people who fought, who were not in regular uniform, were terrorists. And we classed the Montagnards who fought with American special forces as enemies of this country. I, I Probably won't tell you which administration did that, but it was just a, it was a disgusting one. But it was the administration that also eliminated two of the special forces reserve groups from the United States. Uh, that was a, a tragic thing. So that's kind of a, uh, that's a little about that wonderful relationship. Oh, the reason we got the Montagnards to the U.S., a lot of them, was that the Special Forces Association, which has nothing to do with the government at all. It's just the band of SF uh, brothers and such. They raised a lot of money to bring Montagnards to the United States and get them a start here. Yeah. Um, there was one, I, I'm up in Anchorage, Alaska. We had one mountain yard up here that I knew got to be friends with. Bray Penaw was his name. And he had been um, at Doc Siang, our A camp, one of our A camps. And uh, he, was, uh, he was an amazing uh, man. He, he also had been uh, betrayed. Uh, his A-team commander had given him a Green Beret with the 5th Group Flash, and he gave him a letter that said he had served with the 5th Special Forces with our A-team at Doc Siang, which was not too far out of Kantum. He happened to be, when the fall of Vietnam came, Pana was down in Saigon, and he had those things with him. And what happened... They were trying to, um, there was a mob of people at the U.S. Embassy, and he made his way to the front gate. He said there was a Marine sergeant that was there, and he pulled out a green beret. And a guy looked at that, and he says, so, and he saw he spoke English. He says, why do you have that? And he showed him this letter from the A-team captain, and it said, this man fought for us. And the Marine sergeant opened the gate 
physically took him and just dragged him through and then slammed the gate shut again because they couldn't begin to take people and just basically said, you're with us. And that's how he got to be uh, in the United States, or he would have been one of the people that we betrayed. Um, there's a lot of things I could tell you about what happened in the CIA office in Saigon where uh, Frank Snap wrote a book about it called Decent Interval. He was a CIA officer in Saigon. And when we left, we left the files, the CIA files, they left them at their supervisor's orders on the desk, unlocked for Trinsat, which was the North Vietnamese security, so that they could, this betrayal is tragic. And I know a lot of your listeners won't like hearing that, but that had nothing to do with uh, special forces. It had to do with the political class that it, well, what can you say about the people who run this? The military um, has all these honorable people. So anyway, th those would be some things to uh, think about. We treasured our relationship with the Montagnard tribesmen and you, they kept you alive in, in the sense of their uncanny skill at hearing things, at doing things. And of course, they depended utterly on us for tactical uh, planning. And all they knew is that you had these strange little things like a radio headset. And to them, it was kind of magic. And an American would just say something quietly into this and nothing would happen. Um, by the way, this is a picture that I took. This is R.T. Maine when I took this photo. Uh, the gentleman whose head you see here, he was the Montagnard leader. His uh, name was Kip, K-I-E-P. He had been an NBA uh, soldier before. Many of our best Montagnards had actually been conscripted into the North Vietnamese Army and they had made our way to us. And people with that background, we did not trust them unvetted. They were put through a program to make sure that they were loyal. But this was in the middle of a Laotian um, uh, mission. And it was actually, you can't see the bullets flying, but it was, uh, it was a very, uh, very interesting event. Uh, so this is a little of what it was like when you went to SOG. Uh, everyone was a volunteer. And when, well, in our in our case, uh, I think you've you've talked to Dale Hansen, haven't you? We're going to be having him on in a week or two. Okay. Well, he wrote an excellent book, a memoir called "Born Twice." He and I went through the whole military together. We went through SF Selection Group. We were part of a special program that was recruited. We were all volunteers for SOG. You'd have to understand when you were at. Fort Bragg. Um, in fact, yeah, there you've got the book right there. And on the cover, you're seeing an American Huey helicopter. We call them slicks versus guns. And uh, that photo is of my team, RT Maine, and we are dangling about 5,000 feet in the air over Laos. And it is very cold up there at 5,000 feet, even in a hot jungle country. And we had been taken off of another mission in heavy uh, contact. And so uh, Dale decided I uh, let him use that photo. It was taken by one of our medics, Clarence Long. And no one even knew. This is a, an iconic photograph of SOG operations. And Clarence Long, who was the chase medic in another helicopter, he came up to me one day at uh, Contum and he says, hey, Buck, uh, what is, do you want to take a look at that photo I took? And I said, what photo, Clarence? He says, well, it's about you know, when you guys came off of that super hot target on strings out of Laos. Uh, I, uh, I snapped a photo and I thought you might want to see it, uh, you guys. And I'm one of the, there's four of us there. There's two Americans. Dave Baker and myself are there, and I'm on the upper part, and I'm holding a wounded Montagnard against me. Uh, that's why there's two of us right there. 
And so he says, yeah, let me get the photo and I'll show it to you. And I said, Clarence, that is an incredible photo. Everything about that photo is absolutely as like it was staged by Hollywood. And so Dale decided that would be a good cover for his book. I would really encourage everybody to get that book, Born Twice by Dale Hansen, a really outstanding uh, SOG man. And we were there together. So many of the people that he and I went with to special operations were lost. And one point in his book, it's one of the sad things he describes, he'd been badly wounded on a classic RT Florida mission that you'll hear about. And this is one of the biggest intelligence holes of the entire Vietnam War. Uh, his team leader was killed, Ken Wardley, our friend, a Minnesotan. And uh, what, a, what an amazing uh, mission that was. But... Uh, he was wounded badly. He was uh, sent home. His hand was mangled. Uh, and he, finally, he made his way back. They said, you can have your SF assignment wherever you want to go in the world. And he says, I want to go back to CCC because we have a war on. I want to be with the others. So he describes in the book, he finally makes his way back up to the Central Highlands to our camp. And this camp was uh, no one... No one would have seen anything remarkable about the camp. It was not an American installation at all. It was a Vietnamese installation. No one would have known, at least they saw a few Americans there, that it was actually uh, a SOG thing. But he describes he got into the camp and he saw me over there and he comes up and he's, we're very happy to see each other. He's been gone for quite a while. And I've been there, I was there two and a half years continuously other than a few uh, breaks. Um, your tour was one year, but I just, I, will, I just loved being there with the people. But he describes coming up to me and, and we're very happy to see each other. And he says, well, let's go. I want to see the guys talking about the men that we went there with. And I just looked at him and said, there aren't any. They're all dead. So that was the price that got paid sometimes. Um, SOG took three years running. SOG Recon took an excess of 100% casualties. That meant that everybody was going to be wounded, some people more than once. Yes, there were a couple of rare birds that did not get shot up. But for that, somebody else was going to. They almost could give you a Purple Heart the day you reported as a volunteer for SOG. But you didn't know much. All you knew that there was some super secret organization and you never spoke its name. I remember uh, when we reported to Natrang, those of us who were separated because we had volunteered, we didn't know what we had volunteered for. They just lightly called it the special projects. And when you hear the term SOG for um, studies and observations groups, no one ever used that word when you were, you were there. It was... Uh, it was just nothing you said. It was so secret because there was no apparent connection between the Fifth Special Forces and MACV SOG. It was everything was a world of super secrecy. And so I remember, um, for example, there were a bunch of us uh, that came in. We'd been through operations and intelligence uh, training together and all of the training together. And we were all excited about this. And they were, took us into a room. And it was a briefer that was there. And he showed us some pictures. One of the pictures, he said, gentlemen, um, you have volunteered for the world of the special projects. There's almost nothing even now we can tell you about them. But I would like to show you a picture. And he showed us a picture on a slide. It was a black and white picture, and it was a very imposing building. And I thought, wow, what's that? Is that some kind of like secret headquarters for this organization? I said, gentlemen, this is the federal penitentiary for the United States at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And this is where you were 
spend a lot of your life if you ever open your mouth about what you are doing. This is a world of total secrecy. We don't care if you are drunk. We don't care if you are in a cat house. If you open your mouth about our operations, if you have survived, this will be your new home. So with that in mind, we will ask you again, how many of you still wish to join the world of special projects? And everybody looked at it and nobody backed out, uh, probably because we were scared, you know, to, to look bad. He says, okay, here's the situation. There are three camps in SOG. All I will tell you, they work by initials. You do not need to know what they are. Up at a place called DN, it means command and control north. Up in the uh, Central Highlands, you have CCC. That is command and control central. Down in the Red Clay District of Bamituit, you have CCS, Command and Control South. Now, you'd have to understand, everything in that world means nothing. What is Command and Control, bud? Uh, I've no idea. No, Neither does anyone else. What is a studies and observation group? Well, the entire military, the war was called MACV, Military Assistance Command of Vietnam. And if the most boring place you ever could have found in the entire Vietnam War was MACV SOG, the Studies and Observations Group. It was a set of pipe smoking historians in Saigon was all that it was. And you see why the, the media paid no attention to it. Who were these? They, they analyzed the war and uh, the lessons learned to record it for history. That's what SOG was to anyone outside it. Now, if you were inside it, it was sometimes called the Special Operations Group. But the history of it, that term actually went back to CIA days early. Uh, and it became, once SOG was created, they dropped that. And it was the Studies and Observations Group. But it was the most... The way that special forces works, if you want to know where the exciting stuff is really happening, look for the most boring clerical type organizations. And that is where you will find the really cool stuff that's going on, the black warfare operations. So anyway, that was it. Uh, they asked, we need people, we need volunteers at all three of these sites, CCN, CCC, Yes. If any of you have a preference, let us know now and we can accommodate you. So I put my hand up like that and I said, uh, sir, uh, CCC. Now there was a group of good friends of mine, Hanson was there, and they saw that I was very confident. So they decided, okay, Buck, he knows something that we don't know. So they all put their hands up and said, CCC. And so there was a group of us that were bound for CCC. And when we got out of this briefing, we were all very intimidated. And everybody clustered around me and said, okay, Buck, tell us what you know. And I looked up and I said, well, I don't. No, I don't know anything. None of us know anything. They said, well, why did you want to go to CCC? I said, it's because of alliteration. I like all of the three letters together. And so one of my friends, and he says, so we're maybe going to get killed here because you think the three C's look together. He says, well, there wasn't anything else to make a choice on. So I, that worked for me. And I was, right at that point, I was not necessarily the, the most popular person in our small group of uh, close and intimate uh, friends. But that was it. And it turned out all of the three units were amazingly uh, effective at doing worked Laotian with the occasional North Vietnamese one tossed into the mix. They did uh, basically uh, Laotian uh, targets uh, up in the central 
uh, Laos. And then as you move down to the tri-border area, which was faced directly by Kantum, CCC picked up southern Laos for targets and northern Cambodia. So it was CCC that worked both the Laotian and the Cambodian missions. The names changed. They were always changing names, like you had uh, Salem House and Daniel Boone for Laos. You had Prairie Fire for uh, Salem House. Excuse me, Salem House was Cambodia. Daniel Boone was uh, uh, Laos. And such. But they changed these code names so often, it was hard for people in it to keep track of everything, let alone journalists trying to find out what was going on. And then CCS down at Bami Tuat worked the Cambodian targets. And Cambodia had different terrain. It had intense jungle. Um, northern Laos, you actually, you had areas that had pine forests. Uh, occasionally you'd have uh, missions into forested areas. And right in the middle, we, we got all of it together. We got the dense jungle of uh, Cambodia. We got uh, some of the limestone karst country of Laos and such. But when you showed up at Sog, the basic they would talk to you about uh, where would you like to go? And there were only a few openings in recon at the moment. Hansen got one with RT Florida under a classic SF guy, Sergeant Major Norman Doney. He was then a master sergeant, a real uh, uh, professional. And I was uh, I was put into A Company of the Hatchet Force. And there was nothing wrong with that, but I wanted to be in recon. That's where I wanted to be. And I wouldn't stop complaining, but I did join a company of the hatchet force. And we began running operations in the highlands. Um, you would have to understand that where we were in Kantum province, um, that was one of three provinces that were just, they were ceded to the North Vietnamese army. We stopped. Uh, when I was first there, we had the 4th Infantry that was stationed at Confum, and they the pressure was too much on them, so they pulled them back down towards Pleiku in the lowlands. Um, and that just left, there was just us up there in the central highlands. So Confum province was, um, it was like Tain given to the enemy, the Americans, other than special forces, mostly stayed out of there. And so what was that about? Well, when you were new there, you began running training operations in a province that was completely uh, enemy held. And we regarded those as training operations, almost like you had a little bicycle with training wheels. We had people killed on our training. We had people killed on ambush patrols outside of our camp right there at CCC, but it was like none of that really counted. When you came out of Laos and you came out of Cambodia on a hot uh, target, when you crossed, it was called the fence. This was a line of mountains that divided uh, Vietnam from Laos and Cambodia and the Ho Chi Minh Trail. When you came out, it was called crossing the fence and it was a psychological barrier. When you crossed into Vietnam, Everybody just relaxed. It was one, you were home, you were safe because you were just over where the war was, okay? But you had come off of a target that where you would be surrounded by hundreds of enemy soldiers and tracking dogs. And within a few hours, they could bring a thousand of their good infantry to bear on any location and start uh, search and destroy operations. Um, for the economy of force that we talked about before, um, basically for the small number of American special forces that were in SOG, it tied down uh, towards the, the peak of the operations, it tied down 50,000 enemy infant infantry uh, and some of them were their very finest they had in the war. There are special elite counter recon units that were designed just to hunt and uh, find and kill SOG teams. And they were actually very good at what they did. Um, uh, in general, I would say we had a lot of respect for the enemy that we fought. 
there were very few people who hated them. Uh, I always regarded hate as being unprofessional because it distorts your judgment. These were skilled people on the other side. They were fighting for their country. We were fighting for ours. We did not know yet that ours was going to betray us and ours wouldn't, uh, well, I guess in one sense, they, they betrayed the South Vietnamese. Uh, they certainly betrayed the surviving Viet Cong, put them into internment camps uh, because they didn't like the Southern Vietnamese. But uh, anyway, that was, uh, that was just an amazing thing. Uh, how many Americans and how many South Vietnamese soldiers were not killed because about four full divisions or 50,000 enemy troops never entered the war zone to fight against the Americans and the Army of the Republic of uh, Vietnam, Arvin. And so that was forced multiplication at its best. And mostly um, people don't tend to understand that about SF. That's uh, what it did. That is the part of the legacy of SOG that cannot be taken away. All of those people, American and Vietnamese soldiers, who weren't killed. This right here, what you're seeing, is a photograph of RT Maine. This is our launch site we, at Dock Cho. Uh, this was an old control tower. It was not used anymore. If you see the building there, it's a uh, hard wall, but with a gray tent. That used to be a morgue when the 173rd Airborne was in intense fighting in the mountains outside of Dock Cho. And now that whole, that was a Tet Offensive, February 68. Now, uh, SOG had taken that little area there, and this is our team Maine heading out on a mission. Uh, this is me in front going out. You have Miller there, still not speaking, but he loved to cook uh, processed indigenous rations. He would kind of squat over a little stove with C4, and he absolutely liked brewing up these indigenous rations. He was a, he was a good guy. He just never had anything much to say. Uh, he was a Louisiana Cajun. Baker was a charming California guy. I was this uh, young man from Alaska, and nobody really knew quite where Alaska was. I got there, by the way, at 19, and to give you um, with the rules you worked under then is you had to be 20 years old to apply for special forces selection. This is to start the process. So when we all got there, the captain, who was the head of administration, the fine man, De La Russo, he sat me down in a chair and he says, Buck, um, I have a question for you. You probably know that you have to be 20 years old to even start. With SOG, and you're only 19, would you mind explaining that to me? And I said, well, uh, it's hard. To, I'm not sure what happened, Captain. You know, people get confused about birth dates. And so I'm not leaving. <laughs> He says, we don't want you to, but I'm just wondering, how exactly did you pull that off? You know? And I, I could tell it was kind of saying like, are we going to have to burp you after an operation or what? Uh, there is not just a, uh, it's a formation. That was a uh, younger me. I know I presently don't look a day over 25, but uh, well, uh, that was that was me in front of uh, uh, Recon Company there, and uh, I went there as a PFC. Two and a half years later, I left as a staff sergeant, and all I can really say is I feel so immensely privileged to have been with these amazing Special Forces soldiers. Uh, there, I'm over on the left. This is a formation for Recon Company for awards and decorations. And uh, what a privilege it was to just walk in the shadow of these absolute giants. Uh, there is a fellow that I, I was exchanging emails with that he was with an A-team of the 5th 
never met him personally, but we were just talking on an SF site one day this was years ago, and uh, I asked him where he'd been. He told me what A team, and and uh, by the first digit in the A team, you can tell if they were one, two, three, or four core. It was a very uh, well organized system. And he asked where I'd been, and I just said Sog. That's all I said. And I remember he said Sog. That was the land of giants. And I've never forgotten that. Um, these little, these conversations that you have, a friend of mine who was Ted Wizerick, who was on the four drum programs, uh, very fine uh, SF guy. He was one night in our camp, he was walking through the camp and our commander, a lieutenant colonel, was hosting another colonel out of Natrang who was up visiting and Ted was walking immediately behind him and he could overhear their conversation. And the Natrang officer was asking our commander, he says, one thing I don't understand, where do you find men like these? who will do missions like this? Where do you find them? And he said, the CCC commander looked at him and he says, you don't find men like these. They find you. There was in just one of these small conversations that summed up a whole lot about SOG and what it was. There was another conversation uh, that uh, this, again, Tim Wizerick had it, uh, and he was talking one day up at Doc Toe, because you would talk to the aviators. We had the most valiant aviators. Uh, everyone who was with SOG always honors the aviators that no matter what happened, they would come for you. And uh, he was talking with a couple of the, um, the gunners up there on the Huey, the door gunners. One would be a door. They're both door gunners, but the senior one would be the crew chief. It was the way it worked. And anyway, they were they were talking about, you know, what life, he wanted to know what's life like for the door gunners on the Hueys that do so much for us. And he said, well, you'd have to understand what we talk about is that when we go into one of these over the fence targets for a hot extraction of a SOG team, when you are going down into a hover to get a team out under intense fire, that is as bad as our war can ever get because there's so much and half the time your people are coming towards the helicopter in enemy uniform and gear and if you didn't tell us ahead of time we would be wanting to shoot you and then they have to say the ones behind us are not us shoot them please as yes, you're getting on uh operations were colorful they said, this is as bad as it ever gets for us, taking your teams out of hot targets in Laos and Cambodia. He said, but what we talk about is when you get on the slick, on the helicopter, and even if you're still shooting at them, there's, you, you have this expression of peace and relaxation, like everything is fine in your world now. And so what we wonder about is, what has it been like for you out there in Laos and Cambodia for eight days with all of these people? Anyway, these are little snippets. Uh, they're things that you don't think much about, but they kind of give people an idea of what it was like. And I, I would make no claims to myself. This, by the way, on the floor drum, this is where we had come in from a mission. I'm wearing... A, uh, I think it's a 219th aviation recon patch. The reason on the four drum flights that I wore those is you did not want to be, uh, SF was never in uniform over the border, but there you, I wanted to be so I could claim to be uh, one of their aviators if I was shot down. They were not nice to special forces prisoners. You would not die nicely. That's why I have um, a 219th aviation uh, thing. I'm holding a car 15 there. I have the pouch of things, the medical things that camera doesn't show there. You see down here at the base uh, that uh, what you're actually seeing is the bound up set of cargo straps. 
and it's a loop with a buckle. And what you do with that, you break the tape and it's a loop. You've pre-adjusted it. You take one corner of the loop over your right shoulder, one under your left arm. The other, you reach down and you pull it up and the snap link goes through all three. And when a helicopter drops a line down, and it can be five stories sometimes just about it. So the lines can be so long. You do a quick overhand loop, you put it through and you're gone. And it's a rapid extraction uh, thing. It's the kind of thing that we just, where did that come from? We invented it because how else do you get somebody out of the jungle in Cambodia with a hovering helicopter under heavy fire? And it, everything had to work fast. But uh, anyway, that's it. Over here, this is the um, uh, non-directional uh, uh, antennas, I recall. And there's a... Uh, it's fiberglass and that's why where the bullet went through there i'd have been sitting right ahead of it and that bullet would have done me in had it not been maybe a half second uh, off um but it was it was an amazing time you couldn't say enough about the aviators i make no claims for myself i i just honor these marrying amazing people that i got to serve with and learn from and i always felt like uh, you know they were they were amazing, and if I could just hold their coats, that would be good. So I did uh, I did my work first in a company of the Hatchet Force. Then I went over to Recon with RT Maine. The first one zero there was David Kirschbaum before Baker took over uh, the team. Kirschbaum was old style SF. He was an outstanding. Uh, he was like a lot of the people. He was a southerner. Uh, he had quite a few southerners for some reason in SF, and you would be able to understand them by being an Alabama and whatnot. But uh, we had a lot of these good old boys that were there. Kirschbaum um, was one, and when he agreed to take me into RT Maine. This was a real honor. I was very grateful that he let me, because to be able to join one of the SOG recon teams, that was something special. And uh, afterwards, talking with him years later, that's Dave Kirschbaum right there by a captured enemy 12-7 uh, machine gun. And, uh, but I had told him, how much I appreciated his taking me into RT Maine and teaching me the black arts of uh, recon in Laos and Cambodia. He was an excellent teacher. I said, Dave, I, you know, there were other people that wanted to be there. I don't know why you gave me the chance, but I'm grateful. And he said something that, again, it's these conversations and passing that tell you so much about what made him a really classic uh, recon team leader. He just looked at me and he said, uh, I picked you because you were very calm. That is what I looked for. Because missions over the fence were so unbearably tense and frightening that if anyone was high strung, they would not hold up. And you saw this, by the way, in SOG Ops, especially Recon, where you're in such small units, uh, in the heart of enemy territory, there were people that were very brave soldiers that were not suited for missions like that because the, the fear factor and the tension could become almost unbearable at times. And they could work fine with the hatchet forces. It wasn't that they were scared. For well, yes, everyone was scared all the time in operations like that where you didn't go one day or the next. It was more that um, what happened when the helicopter did the insert and you were three Americans and maybe four mountain yard tribesmen, five tribesmen at the most, when the helicopters left, the silence was deafening and you were alone in their backyard and within a very short distance, they probably had one to 2000 soldiers readily available and they all wanted nothing more than to kill you. 
that, by the way, is Kirschbaum over the shoulder right there. Uh, this is Robert Howard. Um, I think that's Danny Lindblom there, Augie Hamilton. This is uh, Chuck Erickson, who uh, was in recon. And I believe Erickson uh, later was on a Sante raid into North Vietnam. Uh, so uh, amazing things were happening. But, but what amazing people these were, bud. And so my claim to fame is I just got to... I just got to hold their coats and say thank you for letting me be here with people like you. Uh, to to walk in the shadow of someone like Robert Howard, who was America's most decorated soldier. Uh, he died a few years ago of cancer. Just an amazing man. And then Norman Doney of RT Florida. Um, what a privilege it was to... Uh, to just learn from these people. And you had the old line professional soldier SF. Then you had a lot of the young pups like myself. We were there for the war. And it was a different, it was a different age group, and we needed them. Um, and the young, the young ones certainly did a lot uh, too. But to have that seasoning for these people was phenomenal. Anyway, those are a few things that uh, come to mind about SOG Ops. Uh, anything you'd like to ask about? I haven't it's, said much uh, about yes. it. Yes, I'm actually going to show you, I'm going to show a photo of uh, Mr. Ted, uh, who you work with the photo lab. That's him yeah. with RP West Virginia. Uh, so He's on the right. Yeah, he is on the right, and uh, there you're seeing uh, the NVA uh, outfits. You see the NVA uh, pouches here on the center of their uniforms. Um, it was each of the teams had tremendous latitude. You were just, this was part of the brilliance of SOG structure, is they gave you a mission, and they did not tell you at all how to go about it. You would have a warning order, you'd have a patrol order type thing, and you knew what had to be accomplished. And it was entirely up to the team to decide how you were going to do it. What weapons did you want to take? What team strength going in? The leader would decide team strength. Um, just all these different things and and they were SOG operations were very carefully thought through ahead of time you would normally have about a week of intense preparation there was mission specific and um, some of the teams for example liked working in enemy uniforms um our team main didn't because it really didn't make any difference in the end uh, they, you were going to be in a shooting match and it might give you a few seconds, but that was all. So we, we didn't do that. Each team would develop its own techniques and there was a special place for training for SOG Recon and you would not believe where it was. People might think, oh, okay, well, was it like a secret underground bunker guarded by Tyrannosaurus Rex and nuclear weapons and uh, all of this. No, it was called the club at CCC. It was the club. And uh, whenever SF has an outpost somewhere, one of the first things they did, the first thing they're going to do is put up the communications facility because your life depends on that in hostile territory. The second thing is to put up a club so that there's part of the U.S. there to defend. We had a very nice club that had been put together by volunteers. And the people like from Recon, you would sit there in the club at night with each other and you would you'd be talking about techniques. Who was doing what? Who got into trouble doing what? Who had good results? So each team would come out with um, with different things. Ed Wolkoff, who I believe we interviewed, um, outstanding uh, uh, SOG man, one zero, went on to become a lieutenant colonel. But for example, he was the head of RT New York. And his idea was he wanted hard targets only because his idea was, no, if, if we get what seems like a, 
a better target, that's when we'll let our guard down and we'll get killed. That's the problem. So the harder the target, the safer we are. That was just the way that he uh, looked at it. RT Maine developed a, uh, a priority that worked really well for us. And I think other teams just saw that it worked. And that is in a contact, the first thing we did with RT Maine, it was a decapitation strike. We identified and took out the enemy leaders immediately. Uh, not just the officers, but the NCO. You, you weren't interested even in the heavy weapons. You were you wanted to kill the leaders, their command element fast. And that threw them into confusion because leadership does matter. That was an example of our team main. Um, so... Uh, and and that's what you did is you always learn from each other. And some of the things that were not uh, like, how do you cross a trail in enemy territory? Because they had a lot of high speed trails. And I don't know, have you had guests that have talked about cr tra crossing trails? Not yet. We haven't gotten to. Okay. Well, there's about, let's say there's six of you or seven of you three Americans, the rest Montagnards, and you're moving in a particular sequence that makes sense. And different teams would have the radio operator in a different place. Usually the radio operator stayed right near the one zero. I was a radio operator for RT Main. It was a heavy prick 25, it was called. Um, and so you're moving through the jungle and you let's say you come up the point man determines there's a high speed trail this is a high speed trail usually two to three enemy soldiers can walk uh on it and so sometimes you'd have a little more now if you're watching a trail which we had to sometimes if you saw three to four especially four enemy soldiers and they were moving um, with weapons at port arms. In other words, their AK-47s were at a 45 degree angle. If you were watching the trail and you saw that come around the bend, you were in deep doo-doo. Because when you saw four enemy infantry lightly loaded with their weapons at Porta. This was point security for a North Vietnamese infantry battalion that knew what it was doing. And they were not far behind. And you were in a world of hurt. You could not make noise, but you don't want five to 600 enemy infantry sweeping over your position. So this is an example of it. How do you cross that trail? And on the surface, you might think, well, it's just a trail. Wouldn't you just cross it? Not necessarily, because the ultimate nightmare for a SOG team in enemy territory is, let's say there's seven of you. If you get one across, two across, the third, and suddenly there's a contact with the enemy, you now have a split team situation that is almost unbearable because you're in two different units. And you can't cross back. So some teams would do it one at a time, very carefully make sure that uh, you might put flank security out to um, to see if anybody was coming, if the terrain was favorable. Uh, another team would line up so that everyone's parallel to the trail. And when it looks safe, you'd all move across together. There wasn't one way that was better. Different teams did different. And it, maybe a team had a technique that didn't work well. You know how you could tell that? The team didn't come back. You knew that they favored a certain thing, and that team did not come back. Well, okay, that was something that had to be talked about in the club. That's considerable length. Maybe that technique they were experimenting with. See, this was the foundation of modern special operations. It all had to be put together, had to be intensely debated, thought about what weaponry did you take? Uh, we had gyrojet rocket pistols that most people didn't even know they existed in the world. It was a James Bond weapon, and uh, you had those. You had silence weapons. We had two types of silence, or uh, technically suppressed, submachine guns. We had the Swedish K, nine millimeters. We used a fair amount. Um, 
they were too heavy. There was the problem with the Parabellum magazines, and the suppression effort takes away some of the knockdown power. That's a, everything's a trade off in that world. We also had British Sten guns from World War II, and the reason I wasn't a big fan of the Sten was uh, they were very simple, and from that standpoint, I like the simplicity of the mechanism. But there was a little bit of bolt chatter. And in the jewel, any metallic sound carries a long way because you never hear metallic sounds in the jungle. Whenever there's a sound of metal, uh, you also learn what the smell of metal is like. And most people don't think about this. After a heavy engagement with the enemy, you smell the death. And people say, well, what is that? Death in jungle fighting smells like iron. Because when a lot of blood has been shed, blood is very iron rich. And you get a, that sharp, it's like an acrid metallic. That stays with you long after the war. The smell of iron. Just like you had a cast iron pipe that you were sniffing. And it becomes one of the, the sights and the sounds of jungle war in it doesn't leave. These are just things you you think about. So, any of this uh, interesting? To yeah, uh, we've uh, we've uh, we've got some good questions so far. Uh, okay. if, if you'd like to take Let's some, do those. awesome. All right, here we go. Okay, can you talk about noteworthy people integrating uh, integral? Excuse me to uh, solidifying special forces in the military. Uh, as far as I could ascertain, many people did not like special forces. Tried to work against it. That's absolutely true. Very intelligent uh, question. In the regular army, of course, you know what legs are. Um, the term leg in the airborne units are very uh, distinct in the military. Uh, they're, they tend to be hard charging, uh, hard fighting units. And the term leg used by the airborne, which in a sense means non-airborne soldier, but it's, uh, uh, you wouldn't, for example, our aviators were not paratroopers, but no one would have ever called them leg. Uh, legs were people who could have been airborne, but chose not to, and instead they were more conventional. Uh, Westmoreland, the uh, commander of MACV for many years, he was an airborne officer. He was not SF, but he really valued SF. And uh, you'd have to understand, SOG was in its own separate world, and it was not subject to the commander of the American military in Vietnam. SOG went to a colonel in Saigon. His supervisor would have been in Hawaii. That's what was called SYNCPAC headquarters, the commander-in-chief Pacific, and from that headquarters, it went to the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. That is a level of review. Uh, some of the missions, the photos we took, would go to the president's desk for a daily briefing, because uh, to the Joint Chiefs as well, because this was their chance to see on the ground what was happening. So Westmoreland was very pro-Special Forces. He really valued uh, them, he understood what was good about it. When he was replaced by Creighton Abrams, who was an armored general, and he may have been a good armored general, but he had no one in SF cared for Abrams because he was a conventional thing. He thought there should not be special forces. You did not need them. You just needed regular soldiers. And regular soldiers are just fine. They're very important. Everyone who's in the military is doing something and they should all be honored. They're serving their country. Um, so the person who, who absolutely did the most was a U.S. senator. You had To put this into perspective, uh, we had at Fort Bragg something called the Gabriel Demonstration. If you look at the John Wayne movie, the old one, The Green Berets, it opens with a Gabriel demonstration, and these were done at Fort Bragg. They showed what an SFA team was capable of, and it was a wildly impressive thing about unconventional warfare skills. It was absolutely fascinating. Well, a young senator had attended 
a Gabriel demonstration. And he was blown just totally away. He understood this is the future. This is unconventional warfare. His name was John Kennedy. He was still a Massachusetts senator. He fell in love with special forces and it became a mutual love affair. He and his wife, Jackie, in fact, Jackie Kennedy had uh, requested an SF honor guard at the president's uh, funeral when he was laid to rest in Arlington. Kennedy loved his special forces. It also helps to understand, remember when we were talking about uh, how the CIA and special forces separated right at the end of the Korean War? Well, there was a, there was a kind of a brotherhood between the two groups, a lot of collaboration through the Vietnam War. There was a, a CIA had no authority over SOG, but they did make targeting requests and they gave us a lot of uh, logistical support. We exchanged information with them uh, in Contum. There was a CIA headquarters and we'd be down there and they were welcome where we were. Um, but it helps to understand Kennedy absolutely loved special forces and he did not like the CIA at all. A lot of people might find that strange. Well, you'd have to understand they betrayed, for political reasons, they betrayed a new president with the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. And they led Kennedy, a new president, to believe that there was an uprising ready to go. They had already put it together. All he needed to do was sign off as a new president. He believed him and there was no uprising. It was a slaughter at the Bay of Pigs. It was just, and it made, it almost brought down the brand new Kennedy administration. Well, the aftermath of that was Kennedy no longer really trusted the CIA. So uh, what happened then, um, and this is really important to understand a big thing about what happened in the Vietnam War, the question of had Kennedy not been assassinated in 1963 in November, would we have had the Vietnam War as we know it? And the answer to that is no. And how do I know that? Well, it's like this. We had already had America fought a war that its people never heard about. It was called White Star. White Star was the counterinsurgency in Laos. And it was a triad concept between the Army Special Forces working hand in hand with the CIA and their paramilitary group, and then the CIA aviation support, which was Air America. There's a movie about that, and it has Mel Gibson in it. And any movie that has Mel in it has probably got to be worth seeing, you know. Um, but that's what it happened. And so these, these amazing SF gray-haired guys, they had fought the secret war in Laos. It was against the Pothet Lao, the communist insurgent, because their first push was not in South Vietnam at all. It was in Laos to take that over, the Elephant Kingdom. And they were utterly destroyed by this uh, triad concept. And that's all that Kennedy was doing. He was bringing special forces in to South Vietnam. But when it came to the big SOG push, Kennedy no longer trusted the CIA as leadership. I'm not, they had some exceptional people. I'm not talking about them at all. They had very, very fine people, a lot of them. But um, at a high level, on a kind of quasi political level. So he specified, Kennedy did, I will not let them run what's happening in Vietnam, it happened in Laos. I want basically unconventional warfare to handle. And this is the whole creation in the mid sixties of SOG. And that is why it, it was so, it was 90% SF is what it was because that was Kennedy. And there was never any intent in his administration to bring in massive, I mean, we were serious about Vietnam, yes, because of the push, but Lyndon Johnson wanted to be a great president and his theory was to be a great president you need a big war and so he already he ran for president as we will not get deeper into vietnam he already had the plans drawn up to bring the first marine division in at da nang everything was a lie that he was doing he was a very corrupt uh, person that's not a political comment that's an ethical moral one it's, i don't care what party he was with one way or the other uh, a weasel's a weasel
But anyway, this is what happened. And uh, so the CIA, as far as their role, uh, they had an important role. Probably their most important um, role, other than just in an intelligence uh, sense, was they ran a program that in English was called uh, uh, Project Phoenix. Phoenix was a phenomenal success. And uh, I'm trying to think of the Vietnamese name. We usually called it Phoenix. But it was the systematic assassination of the communist terror infrastructure in Vietnam. And the Phoenix effort, uh, Phu Long comes to mind, but uh, uh, I don't know, it's been 50 years uh, to remember the Vietnamese. What they did, they identified the terror infrastructure that was responsible for these horrible things. They identified them very carefully and they just killed them all. And um, that was a tremendous thing. Um, that's what you have right there. Uh, yeah, Fung Wong uh, was the Vietnamese for it, Fung Wong. Um, and so that was a tremendous CIA success because at that point, America was very aggressive and you identify the enemies, the people who were doing the really bad, and you just went out and killed them. And there was a lot of cooperation between the CIA and special forces. Uh, you could do a whole program about how the two kind of ended up splitting at the end of the war and what they split over. And they've never quite rejoined. Um, it's just kind of interesting. Um, in general, uh, as far as someone's asking, did I have any run-ins with the CIA? No, we always got along with them, but mostly we didn't in SOG. Down at the Saigon headquarters, they had CIA reps, and our contact with them, other than, hey, how are you, having volleyball games at their compound, or they'd come to ours now and then, um, steak night. Uh, if you wanted weaponry, something exotic, the CIA labs at CCK in Taiwan, uh, if you could sketch out the design for a weapon, they would build it for you. They had, uh, I think it was Ben Baker was his name. He was a former saw guy that was now had crossed to the company. Anyway, it was, uh, um, it was, they had a different war going. And for most of the Vietnam War, they actually contributed um, well. There's a whole story about what happened later with the CIA as it became more and more politicized. And now I think everything is going to get too politicized. But uh, series of Russians or Chinese advisors, uh, well, it's funny you would ask about that. There certainly were cases where there were Russians who were known to be, there were a few that were active. What we saw a lot of were the Chinese. And you reached a point, in other words, when the, the war was first going on, and especially up through Tet, you had a lot of the Viet Cong in uh, South Vietnam. They were doing, and as more and more of them were being killed by the American war effort, the North Vietnamese Army would adopt uh, VC uniforms and unit designations to keep the idea uh, going that the VC was there. But of course, the North Vietnamese Army were fully trained and disciplined troops, and the VC were were less uh, formally trained and whatever. Uh, so the next phase of the war, everything became NVA. And they, again, they were well-trained, well-equipped and such. The people we ran against were very well-equipped, well-trained. They had an advantage because they were near their resupply. You were carrying about 85 pounds of equipment. If you didn't have it on you, you wasn't there and you couldn't get more. And so they could have a blanket with some rice sacks in it and some ammunition and a few grenades, and they could be very lightly equipped. And we had to carry about 85 pounds per person. Uh, so it was a problem. We had to do it silently. Uh, but what happened as we killed more and more of the North Vietnamese, the Chinese began to be involved in the war. 
on, they refuse to believe that SOG teams were now fighting and killing uh, Chinese. There was a classic mission that CNC ran, and it involved uh, one of our teams, and it was my team, our team main. We killed all the leadership. It was our typical decapitation strike. We were on the other side of some bushes. These were highly expert, beautifully trained prisoner snatch people, and they had they were really doing court press. They wanted a prisoner from our team main, and they they were very skilled at us into a position where there was almost nowhere to go. So Baker, our leader, had made the decision, there's over a hundred of them, there's seven of us, and we are gonna fight them to the death. That was the decision was made. And we had moved into a position for a defilade ambush and they came right up to it. And before we triggered the ambush, they stopped because it was midday and they sat down on the other side of the, the set of bushes and they had their meal break. So we were listening to them the whole time, but we killed all of the Chinese officers. They were there, our interpreter was Chinese speaking uh, as well. And so this was the final proof we were fighting the Chinese army in Vietnam because prior to that, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't do that. Let's see. Did you encounter any foreigners during your time? Yeah, we um, special forces recruited, especially the tenth group in Europe. Uh, the tenth group had people. We had teams that spoke Czech, for example. Uh, teams that spoke Polish. Uh, you, you had all of this. The tenth group was very heavily uh, staffed with people who were. Uh, well trained. We had there was a captain Heinz Roche that was in CCC, and he was he was killed. He, later he was up at uh, Da Nang. He was killed at their uh, place up there. We had uh, Jan Novi, a uh, classic guy. He had been in the Czech cavalry, if you can believe that. He was an old man, old line SF, a uh, wonderful person. He was one of our instructors and in training group. He was there at CCC. We had a major there from Jacks who was Czech, spoke German well. So yes, we had a lot of people. SF really valued, um, by the way, one of the things that separates special forces from um, many other units is the intense focus on both language and culture. It goes to the very heart of what SF does with force multiplication. Uh, more other units, uh, they, they don't necessarily emphasize the language as being important. In SF, it is extremely important, and people are, it's one of the things they assess you for is linguistic ability. So, yeah, we had some wonderful people who were there. There were even a few people who had fought. There's Heinz Roche, the captain. He was the A Company captain. And uh, he, he was uh, he was lost up at Da Nang, like a lot of our yeah, a lot of our people ended up being lost. So other questions. Let's see. Wider operations over the fence should have been conducted. Um, yes. Um why did we allow enemy sanctuaries? Basically, the United States is not serious. We want wars, and we want them to continue, but we do not want to win them decisively. So, for example, what you had there, you had North Vietnam invading South Vietnam. If you went north of the DMZ, you had... Uh, I'm trying to think. It's the railway intersection that's up there uh, to the north. And I know the name of it, but I can't really think of it. But there were two ways. By cutting that intersection, you would have severed everything that they were doing. And you could have done it in one of two ways or a combined. You could have done a seaborne, like an amphibious a marine assault right there, uh, and it's the famous railway junction. I, I don't know. We had lots of people who understood this is all that it would take. The other way is an airborne assault to just put in like the 173rd of the, you know, uh, uh, any of the really good airborne units to just take it and cut North Vietnam in two. Uh, 
And the first thing they would have had to do is pull most of their troops back out of the south, and uh, you would have had them in pitch, pitch battles and so on. Uh, that would have been the best thing. Now, SOG did run some major cut-the-trail operations, but by the nature of it, they had to be done secretly, not as great big things. Um, and so this is what Operation Tailwind was about. That was a tremendously successful thing. Uh, it's insane, the rules that that the civilians, in this case, you had McNamara, who was a failed Secretary of Defense, and he had a bunch of college kids, and he decided the military and the CIA didn't know what they were doing, but his college boys did, and they would decide on what targets could be struck. Uh, and these were sometimes people would say, we don't care what some teams say they saw there. Uh, examples um, at some of our A camps in the war, such as uh, Long Bay, uh, recon teams from Project Delta. Project Delta out of Natrang did in country reconnaissance on SF, and uh, SOG did out of country reconnaissance. All of the two overlapped when. Well, Delta didn't go over the border, but we would do things in the Moshau or the Yadrang if they needed help. For example, in the Yadrang, there were times that Project Delta, their teams were just getting ripped because they were not, it wasn't, they weren't used to the heavy saturation patrolling. So there were times that they would ask for SOG teams because you were used to just all these enemy troops around you. Uh, and so, for example, if if you they were tracking you, well, uh, different people did a different way. But if you could get in be, behind them, they had an infantry con country company, excuse me, tracking you. Um, you. If you could get in behind them and follow them, they would never catch on to that. In my experience, They'd, you could just wherever they were looking for you, you just stayed right in. You weren't far behind them, but they wouldn't realize that. Um, another example that we had, because we did, uh, we had to do a lot of wiretaps. There were reasons why wiretapping the enemy. The first thing is that uh, only at that point, only battalion-sized units, about five, six hundred infantry, had hardwire uh, communications one to the next. So when a SOG team tapped into the line, you had priceless information about what they were up to. Now, the problem is tr they had uh, their transat people, their intelligence people, and they were monitoring. And whenever you tap into a line like that, line resistance on an ohmmeter is going to rise. And they would think, well, wait a minute, somebody is just tapped on. And now the team would go out looking all the way between the two battalions. Where is SOG here? Where are they tapping? And it was a, it was a problem because you would lose teams in that situation. And so we had a uh, approach we had developed, which is where they had their battalion. There was an area they were all sloppy about, and that was right outside their gate. And so if the American team moved in, for example, 15 feet from their unit position, uh, patrolling out would not be, they wouldn't want to check that first area because it was so secure. But you go twice that distance and then they'd start checking along the line very carefully. That's an example of how one team would come up with something. And there were so many teams doing good things. Um, those wiretap missions were very successful. There's a detail about what made them incredibly uh, rich and intelligent that to this day I wouldn't say on anything public, uh, but it just gave us a tremendous amount of useful information. Then the problem was you, the team had it. You had it on uh, wiretap or, excuse me, on tape recorders, but you had to get out alive it wasn't like burst transmission like they have now. Now, uh, special ops teams can do all of the exotic communications. And that is a, a wonderful blessing. And it's also a terrible curse. And the reason it's a curse, when a SOG team went in, you once or twice a day, you might have a chance of a radio contact 
with friendly uh, coveys overhead or uh, spaffs or whatever. But uh, what happens now with special ops and these satellite phones that do burst transmissions, uh, now you have in Special Operations Command, you will have generals who say, well, they need the final say, not the team on the ground. And so I know of cases like this where SF teams operating in Afghanistan with zero stand, people like that from people that are in now, they had the chance to take very high value targets and they were not allowed to do it until they had authorization. And some general at a country club or a golf course, wherever they happen to be, had to be briefed. And then are there issues of collateral damage? And at that point, uh, sometimes they couldn't do the strike, not because they couldn't get it approved, but they couldn't get it done in time. Whereas a SOG team, they put you in and you had a mission to accomplish. If you did anything that you thought was warranted to get the mission done, and you didn't need anybody's permission. So uh, stories about Baba, he wasn't there while I was there. So any stories that I would uh, have were were kind of, we had, I'm trying to think of the name of it. We had a big python snake. Georgia. 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 All right. And in our, in our club, we had behind each booth, you had a shelf there that was about six inches wide. And Georgia would come sliding along. And everybody liked Georgia. Everybody's familiar with her. But people would come in like aviators and ordered us. And they didn't know that there was a python there. And all of a sudden, they'd be looking eye to eye with a python and about, you know, uh, losing bladder control, just bah, 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 bah. but it was a colorful group. Uh, uh, by the way, Contum, where we were, was famous for tigers, and Teddy Roosevelt, the American president, a long time ago, hunted tigers up in Contum province. Uh, we did have, I know, one team that was in an RON that remained overnight position, and and a tiger became in, and you can imagine, you know, the luminous eyes and the, as a, one person described, the tiger breath and such. And he didn't attack anyone, but they were obviously, you know, a tiger is just a, a ferocious thing. Uh, you had, for what this is worth, we had alarm systems that uh, you could use, and they were very sophisticated. Um, detection systems for RON, and you know what they were, was monkeys, because <laughs> what would happen in jungle is monkeys are very sensitive to whatever's going on, and when you move very silently, they're not as worried, they know you're there, but the way you do an RON, for instance, is before it gets dark, you establish a false position. In case someone is tracking you, that is where they will attack during the night when it's really dark. And when it gets dark, you then move to not terribly far, but to a different location. You do this, but you have to do it very silently. And if there's monkey chatter in the trees overhead, once they decide that you're not a problem for them, they go silent. But during the night, if anyone comes anywhere near, they're an alarm system. So these are the things that you just learn about and uh, learn to use. Uh, the training for extractions and such, uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, we did a lot of training. Uh, we actually did much more training about getting into targets than getting out because repelling we had a repelling tower, a high one right there in our uh, CCC operation. So repelling in the targets was where you really needed the training. The extraction systems were not that complex. I uh, mentioned the system like the, oh, the rig with the, uh, the three-point tie and the snap link. Then they came out with the ladder system. Dhoni was very uh, important with that. But it's still, the ladder had to come down to you. You put a snap link onto it. And so it didn't take that. It wasn't like Skyhook or anything like that that was really exotic. So the, uh, the training tended to be more about the infiltration than the exfiltration. 
So, but uh, SOG teams were training constantly. Did you add any indigenous members during the time? Yeah, you would. Uh, you would cycle. Sometimes uh, you'd have new people in, and you train them. Uh, SOG teams were continuously training. And we had a yard camp range. There were no limits, whatever, on ammunition and explosives. If, if you wanted to blow up the whole world, nobody would have questioned. If you wanted a wheelbarrow full of C4, they would have given it to you and you just signed for it for record. So you would spend prior to uh, targets. Um, in general, you did a lot of mission uh, training. You did a lot of what were called immediate action drills. And they were how you stay. The question is, how does, a, let's say, a seven or an eight man team fight a 200 man enemy unit and win? Well, let's say that there are eight of you and you're moving single file through the jungle, enters a contact from the front. Well, each person has a number. You are odd or even. You're one, um, which would be Montagnard, one or three or five. And so if you're an odd number, you take a solid step to the right. If you're an even number, you would go a solid step to the left. This is how we did it on our team main and many other teams. It doesn't mean that every team everywhere did this. There was a lot of latitude, but the team would immediately, suppose you have people, you split instantly into two columns that are parallel. And now the front two people are going to start on full autom automatic fire. They're going to start outward and they're going to be firing in an arc to the center and uh, about the second or usually the third round from the end in your magazine would always be a tracer round to warn you that it's about to go. You did not reload there. The two that were expending their ammunition would turn and go right down the middle. The next two are already firing on full automatic, but from the out side in and you'd go through one whole team cycle of that and you are cutting down the jungle with a gunfire uh, in general despite what the movies say automatic weapons fire is more of a waste than anything you expend your your ammunition this by the way is one of the operating diff differences i think between seals and sf seals expect to have more resupply capability and so they're more oriented towards the and I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying it's when you're in a place like that, you don't waste ammunition. But the first goal is fire suppression. Automatic weapons will pull high under the right. You can count on that. And so you you consciously aim low and to the left, and that's how you get body hits. But you train intensely for this. And after about one cycle like this, now you're going to you're back in the original team position. The leader, without saying anything, will indicate the route to go and the Montagnard point man will go in that direction and it is a terrifying thing for people there can be 200 of them there will probably be 30 of them that are dead at least from the initial immediate reaction if they are hit from the side then you do the same thing you split but now the team is lengthwise but you you rehearse that again and again and especially with new team members it has to be reflexive and that's what keeps you alive. That is why an eight-man team could fight a 150 to 150-man infantry company and survive. It was amazing. Uh, Jeep stealing was an art in special forces, and uh, there's so many. In our case, we actually had one of the SPAFs. I'm not going to tell you his name because if I did, then... Um, Claude Phillips, the the person in question, you know, that he would be upset because I went ahead and said it was Captain Phillips, the SWAT pilot that stole one of the Jeeps and had us repainted. But uh, I'm not going to tell you that um, Phil Phillips was uh, was guilty of that Jeep stealing uh, crime. Yeah, so he's another good one. Yeah, and and this is just between us, right? This is between yeah, absolutely. You and me it's and, all and, yeah. So just a, just a small circle right here. 
Oh, okay. But yeah, Jeep stealing was kind of an art, and we had quite a few stolen uh, uh, or, uh, vehicles and such. And uh, when you have special operations groups, it is hard to ride close herd on them because they do a lot of colorful, zany things because they don't know if they're going to be alive the next week or the next month. And so their commanders need to know when uh, we had good commanders, we had bad commanders. We had a few that I thought were really embarrassing. They shouldn't have been Eric. They were so conventional. And we had some that just knew, just looked the other way about some of this. Um, Another thing that was kind of, we in our small unit at CCC, this is worth knowing. This isn't about Jeep stealing. It's about supply stealing, though, on a huge level. Uh, but up there in Contum, um, we burned through supplies at a level. Now, explosives, ammunition, they, that was part of it. Uh, Singlob, the colonel in Sion, said his philosophy was every man had to be so intimately comfortable with all weaponry that they didn't have to worry in a firefight. They would always win. That was his idea. It was a good theory. But every about then, I would see every six months or eight months, down in the train, they would look at what are these guys at CCC doing? They're there's only a certain, uh, there's a few hundred of them American, and they are, they're ordering tremendous amounts of medical supplies and bunks and uh, blankets and all of this stuff. And are they selling it on the black market? And so the, from the Trang, or the fifth group headquarters, they would always pick a major. Don't ask me why, but it would be a major. And it would send them up to investigate us. And they, for some reason, they always used me for this. One thing was I could speak French. And so it um, was one of my languages. And I would go down to meet the airplane at the Contum Strip. And I'd introduce myself to the major. And I'd say, uh, sir, I've been uh, detailed to bring you uh, out to CCC. But our commander asked, do we make two stops first, if that's all right with you? And I'd always say, oh, well, if the colonel wants that, we'll make the two stops. So I'd take him into Contum, the city, to the Montagnard Hospital. This is the place that treated the Montagnard people. The Vietnamese called them Moi or savage in Vietnam. They didn't treat them. And so there was a missionary doctor, uh, Pat Smith, kind of a secular missionary, and she ran a hospital uh, for all of these badly wounded, some of them had stepped on mines, they'd lost uh, uh, legs and such. But I'd take the major through there, and everywhere he looked, he would see these badly injured yards, and all of the supplies said U.S. Army. And I'd introduce him to Dr. Smith, who was there, and I'd say, uh, Dr. Smith, I'd like you to meet Major so-and-so. We'll call him Smith. He's up from the train, and he's uh, he's responsible in part for getting you the supplies that make your hospital work. And she would say, Major, thank you. You see, these people would have nothing if it weren't for special forces and the U.S. Army. Thank you. And you know, what is the Natrang major? It's just everywhere. It's just all the bunks, all the blankets, everything, the medical equipment. It's the whole thing is, is done by the U.S., but it's actually felony theft of the equipment. Then the next place that I would take them was about a mile and a half from our camp. Most people who were there never went to this place. It was a walled uh, facility and it was a leprosarium. Very few people ever go to a leprosarium for people with Hansen's disease. And I'd say, now, uh, we're about to go into a leper colony. Uh, you don't have to be alarmed. It's not readily transmissible. These are old French nuns. They spend their lives ministering to these people, the poorest of the poor. They, they can't even go out from where they are. So we're going to go in. Don't worry about getting leprosy. I've been here many times. And I'd ring the bell, and an elderly nun would come out. And uh, I always had to translate and we'd go through. And again, all of the bed, all of the blankets, all of the medical supplies, a lot of the food, it was all U.S. Army. Okay? 
And these elderly nuns would come over and they'd kiss this Natrang major's hands. And say, what they're saying, sir, is that these people thank you. That if it weren't for the U.S. Army and the Fifth Special Forces, these people would have nothing. But they have everything. And so we would leave. And I'd just look at the, the officer they'd sent up and I said, now we're headed and four minutes, I'll have you up there and you can conduct your investigation as to whether anything is being stolen. Because yes, it is all being stolen. And it was all the same thing. The person would just like me and say, look, this is the, the only thing I wanna know is, do you need more? Tell us what you need, and it will be here soon. This is, this is how wars are won. And it's the kind of thing, hardly anybody would know that SOG did things like that, that it worked you know, with orphanage. It wasn't part of the mission. Pro it was just what soldiers did in areas that were in. But yes, technically, though, that was felony theft, the misappropriation of supplies. We were, we were glad for it. Anyway. Uh that's that's amazing, and uh, uh, and another reason why all of y'all need to go get Mr. Dale's book. It mentions that and a little bit of, about that mm -hmm. in the book. But I did not know about the leopard colony until I uh, began speaking with Mr. Mike and another uh, an officer at CCC uh, by the name of uh, John Pinstreet, uh, and he would occasionally help mm -hmm. out the nuns with those supplies. So. Uh, the SOG men were much more than heavy duty combat. They were, they were the more terrible state. Because it was about culture and language. Did you run into any slash and burn areas? Um, we didn't, um, the reason we didn't see a lot of them, there were a lot of them in the Central Highlands. The Montagnards did that. Uh, where we went, there were almost no civilians because the North Vietnamese on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they had just cleared everyone out and they had basically enslaved people who were there for their work battalions, the labor battalions. I know of a few missions where people did see some villagers, uh, but basically they were few and far between. Where we worked, if, if there were people there, you could kill them. It was that simple. You didn't always want to because you didn't want to give away your location. The best SOG missions. So, for example, the first across the uh, across the uh, fence uh, mission that I did with RT Main under Kirschbaum, um, we were assigned into a target called Juliet Nine. Every team that went into Juliet Nine got the piss shot out of them. It was really bad. Usually about half the team would be casualty in Juliet 9. It was, uh, it was an area that was considered almost impossible to penetrate. Uh, so that it was, what could you get before the team was shot out of the target? Kirschbaum was such a master of what he did. He led us into Juliet 9, the, the impossible target, and we spent eight full days there. We all we went to the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the heart of their country. We went through base areas and such, and they never caught us. And people thought, this is, this is amazing. Well, it was the quality of uh, his leadership. Um, and so that was, that was amazing. But we, in general... We saw a few areas, but there were there were slashed and burned, but there weren't people in them because they'd been cleaned out. Um, we didn't have those uh, kind of scenarios about what if people saw you, what would you do about mission security? I just never knew it to be a problem for us. And I can't say what it might have been like for DM teams or maybe CCS because everything in SOG was heavily compartmentalized and you you didn't get to hear much at all about what happened in other sections like South. It, it was just a, an amazingly uh, good security system, except in Saigon at SOG headquarters, they had enemy penetration because of political appointments in. So uh, let's see, what's that? Why haven't I written a book yet? Um, I'm in a number of them that are out there. I'm not sure. I guess the honest answer to that is I never felt like I was all that important or special. 
I, I just was surrounded with these absolutely amazing. Yeah, uh, Stephen Moore, uh, unco- one of his chapters begins with uh, some stories about me or whatever. And uh, and especially about being young, like, how did you get there at that age? There were a few of us that sneaked in that weren't old enough or whatever, because you'd have to understand in SF, they like people who have style and who who just do outrageous things. They make room for people like that. I probably should, but I feel like so many of these people were so amazing that, you know, what have I done? Uh, I, I just, you, I, I, I second uh, zero. My thought Scott, you, uh, you, you should definitely write a book. So you got more than enough history, and we're around, like you said, a, a giants in the community. I think it'd be one hell of a book. Well, we'll see. It's uh, hmm. that's Operation Tailwind. Were you there when they got back? Yes. That was B Company. Uh, we had two uh, hatchet force companies, A Company that I served with. Then you had B Company. And uh, the Tailwind operation, uh, first off, everybody came back wounded. Uh, it was a deep penetration into Cambodia. It was designed, uh, the ad was called Cosvin, the, uh, the enemy headquarters for the southern half of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We had identified it. We knew where it was, and Tailwind was put together, and it was a deep penetration strike. And the problem was we did not have the helicopter support to pull it off. We needed Jolly Green Giants, and I think they were called CH3s, if I remember right, because we never saw them in ours. Well, they asked, they asked to have Marine Jolly Green Giants seconded for the tailwind operation. The Marine commander um, wanted a guarantee that the landing zones would be secure, which was uh, almost high humor because going into the headquarters of the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia um, was, no, it was anything but secure. However, the mission was really important. And so they were Uh, perhaps led to believe, oh, it should be a piece of cake, don't worry. Well, they had, as I recall, three Jolly Greens shot down promptly. It was uh, was an amazing thing. Gene McCarley was the captain command. You know, this is a huge uh, incursion, and they struck at the heart of the enemy operations at their intelligence center. They went through, they had like dollies that were rigged on this. They could just take the filing system out, uh, the it was a phenomenally successful thing, but they then had to keep moving because they were in a hornet's nest. And how any of them got alive, got out alive, was was amazing. They had a really fine uh, thing. But you'd have to understand this is just a special forces captain, an O3, and he's commanding a phenomenally important. Uh, incursion and from a regular standpoint they probably would have had all kinds of people overhead and helicopters giving stupid orders for people on the ground to follow and this is just this is the captain and his job was to keep his men alive and he did it really well but when they came back to camp (laughs) none of them looked good they were definitely um pretty pretty battle worn and uh, hurt so it was uh, it was amazing mike rose who was the medic on tailwind he got a distinguished service cross i wrote it up for him because i was good at writing things uh franklin miller was went doug miller i actually wrote what happened with miller on rt vermont is that i was approached by one of his one one He'd been medevaced, and as one one came to me and said, "Would you help me write up a recommendation for Doug?" And so I did, and I said, and then I went to the commander's office and I said, "Look, um, sir, I, I believe this should be submitted as a Medal of Honor uh, request." And he says, "No, I won't approve it above a DSC or whatever." Well. It was approved anyway over the commander's uh, decision because it was a phenomenal job. There were, I'm trying to think, it was seven or nine medals of honor that went to recon company in CCC. 
Um, and how to put it, um, it was something about Contum that produced a lot of that because you were in the tri-border area. But I think people were just as brave in Da Nang. Uh, yep, that's it. That Uncommon Valor is about recon company at CCC and five wow. there. Yeah. Uh, Robert Howard, who we mentioned, he was put in for the Medal of Honor three different times, and he abundantly deserved it every time. They turned it twice. They made it DSCs, Distinguished Service Crosses, and a third time he got the Medal of Honor. Uh, it was one of the most amazing men I've ever met in my life. But they had all these larger-than-life people, and, and I just couldn't say enough about it, nor could I say enough about the aviators that flight after flight, they would risk their lives. Um, and what would you have done without it? Um, they just came for us. And if two of their slick scotch still came for us anyway, the next ones did. And consequently, when you were on bright light duty, and we did bright light, usually up at Docto at the airstrip, that canvas top Morden building tent, um, when a slick went down anywhere, and it wasn't only SOGS, if they, they lost a helicopter somewhere in that area, we would go, and uh, your job was to get the people out alive. This is RT Maine. Uh, you're seeing right there, this is Andre, the interpreter, Sui Ken, uh, Vin, I think that's Baker, and that's Miller there. Right there. A little story about this. This was a secure area that we guarded, and across the airfield, there was an artillery unit there. They had nothing to do with us. We were, they thought we were just some strange CIA operation. One day, a Jeep pulled up here to this gate, and out of the Jeep comes a second lieutenant. And I mean, this guy, the creases on his uniform were so beautiful. He was clean shaven. He was as spiffy as can be. And everybody there is in sterile operations. And he tries to enter. He tried to enter the secure area. And these montgomery's you're seeing, they just simply point their weapons at him. And I was there and I said, uh, Lieutenant, if you come any further, they will kill you. They don't speak English. And if they don't know you, they kill you if you try and come in here. I'm afraid it's a secure area. So if you could please wait out there. Uh, is there anything that uh, I can help you with? He says, yes. He says, it's very stern. I, th I think he probably for shaving, I think he put milk on his cheeks and a kitten licked him or whatever. And, and it, it was nothing wrong with him. He's just a young guy, probably right out of training. He says, you men are out of uniform. What do you say to a special ops slash CIA group of cutthroats, you know, uh, scraped from the decks of a pirate ship? You men are out of uniform. You're in trouble. And as it happens, our unit commander, who was one of the finest officers SF ever had, Colonel Fred Abt, he was there, and he was more out of uniform than anybody. He had this Hawaiian shirt on, a pair of raggedy cutoffs, a pair of sneakers, and kind of a boonie hat with uh, that. Nothing, no one had uni uniforms there. There was a sterile area. So uh, he was kind of looking at this, and I said, um, I said uh, Sir, the lieutenant here is upset because he feels that we are, that they would have had to come across this little walkway here in this ditch, which was mine. Uh, he says, he says that we're out of uniform and we're in a lot of trouble. Now, bear in mind, there's no way to tell this is an SF colonel. All right. So he comes over and he says, really, Lieutenant, um, that sounds pretty serious. And the Lieutenant had his little notepad out and his pen. And he says, well, I want you to know I'm fair, but I'm firm. And if you're cooperative, I I won't go too hard on you, man. And so Colonel Apt, he's having fun with this. He says, well, what, uh, what exactly uh, do you require of us, Lieutenant? This is a second Lieutenant. And he says, I expect to see some IDs. Well, we did have IDs because uh, you didn't, you left those there when you went out. So the Colonel, he hasn't said anything about his rank. He just shows, he says, 
Well, Matt, I, I guess you better show your IDs because uh, he's an officer and we better do what any officer says. And of course, we're all keying off of Colonel App, the unit commander. So we take out it. And here's this lieutenant. He's writing our names. And he's kind of explaining, I know you think that maybe your careers are over, but I'll put in a good word for you because you've been quite the, the whole thing was my comedy. And again, he was probably a really good guy. And he just needed to figure out how to be an officer. He may have been a very fine one later. And I think this made him better. So the last person in line that gives him the ID is Colonel Apt. And his hand starts to shake as he sees this. He's been chewing ass on this SF Colonel. And his hand is literally yeah. shaking. Okay. It's, it does this. And uh, Colonel Apt at that point, he takes his notepad out of the Lieutenant's hand, puts it in his pocket, and he takes the ID out and he says, uh, Lieutenant, will there be anything else that you require of us? And just this poor, this poor young officer, this is just probably the first thing that's ever happened. He's just speechless. He's, he's expected to see a wet stain on the front of his uniform. He was just so, it's got, because uh, the way that it worked in unconventional operations, if a, if a leg unit colonel crossed horns with an SF captain, it would be the colonel that would lose because of the backing that SF had in Vietnam with Westmoreland until uh, Abrams came. And so this happened. So this lieutenant, he was just, he couldn't even speak. He got into the Jeep, uh, ashen faced, started his Jeep and drove off. And at uh, the colonel, didn't say a word, a left for contum after that. We were the bright light team. And the Americans were up there. We were talking about this. I said, and, you know, the baker said, how would you have handled that if you were the colonel? And we all agreed we would have been probably petty and given him a hard time or whatnot. And App didn't. He never said a word to him. He didn't need to. He was teaching a young officer, this is not how you really want to do things in a war zone. And we asked, we talked about that. Do you think that young officer was a better officer because of how he was treated by this SF colonel. And we all agreed, yeah, we wouldn't have had the class and the dignity just to show that mercy. He never said a word to him. He could have. He could have ripped him up one side, down the other. And he just treated him with kindness and kind of a fatherly way. So it says a lot. Uh, Apt was one of the most revered SF officers that I ever knew. We had some exceptional ones. We also had some that were not good because of legs. They'd been through all the, but they they had a leg mentality and whatever. But the ones who were good understood when you have conventional warfare people, you're going to have to cut them some slack, especially in risky operations, because, you know, there's a lot of spirits, whatever. Anyway, that's a lot more than you guys probably ever wanted to know about things. So. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, this is a, uh, I, I finally found this. This has taken me uh, months to find Jason book. I'm a, if y'all don't have Jason Hardy's book, y'all need to go get these. But uh, I managed to dig up a photo of you in the top, and I had never seen this photo until recently. Uh, but you here at the top. Uh, what, was that your last duty uh, while you were at CCC? Uh, that would have been when I was in the Ford Drum program. And what Ford Drum was about... Uh, we were having a lot of teams shot up really badly. Remember, for three years running, you had over 100% casualty rates. And the idea came, we had been having really good success in these bird dogs doing the photo intel, low level. And by low level, I'm talking about the wheels of the bird dog were skimming across the jungle. And uh, they had, they had a, a very sophisticated anti-aircraft defense system, these big quad 50s. They had regular anti-aircraft emplacements and such on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, the Russians were testing there. They had radar control, flak guns, this type of thing. And uh, so the idea came out, since we're getting some phenomenal photos that meant we didn't have to target teams, 
why couldn't we try a special program, which they named Ford Drum, and they would target some aircraft with photographers. Wizarick was one. I was one. Frank Greco was another one. Greco wrote another book, Running Recon, that you probably have. Very fine book. Uh, and so we would go out, and you, you just, a lot of this was Dawn Patrol stuff where uh, you – you would launch at ODARC 30 because you wanted to be over the target at the trail at sunrise because right at sunrise and sunset, the slanted light would show you communications wires that were not normally visible in the jungle and you could track them and you would then find battalion sized units and they were masters of concealment. And so we would just simply, we'd, confirm the uh, units were there and then you could arrange uh, it was a form of group therapy and the group therapy was done by f4 phantoms and a1e sky raiders but uh, we called it uh, group therapy just like the selector switch you had single shot and group therapy is what you called it. <laughs> there was a lot of off the wall humor but four drum was about that and it was, again, it was a secret within a secret unit. So most of the people at CCC wouldn't, and we'll, we'll tell you about this in a minute. Um, most of the people didn't, they never heard the term four drum. So passionate about secrecy. They knew we were doing these low level photo in, in the, and half of these uh, bird dogs were in got shot down. Uh, it was a, really, these were very, very valiant people. They went under the call sign SPATH because SF guys were called Sneaky Pete's, traditionally Sneaky Pete operations. And they could like the term we gave them of Sneaky Pete Air Force. There was distinct to CCC that we had these people uh, north and south did not have them. They used uh, air support, including bird dogs, but at CCC, they actually gave us, at, by a request, a set of these people. Here, this is the leader of Cambodia, was a prince. He was a genuine prince. Uh, he was not a prince formerly known as an artist, but uh, he was the prince and the leader of Cambodia. His name was Norodom Sihanouk, and he tried to play in between North Vietnam and the United States and South Vietnam. And so we knew through our intelligence system that he had a secret meeting with the North Vietnamese, and it would be in a very secure area over the fence in a town in Cambodia, and it was very high security, and this is the building in which the meeting would be held, quite high level, and so it was the leader of Cambodia, the whole country, and so it was the mission that came to us for Poor Drum uh, that I flew, they said, can you fly an airplane? You know how little room there is between the temple buildings? Can you fly an airplane in between those buildings. And I thought, this is going to be interesting. And uh, the Doherty was the pilot. And this was really a balls to the wall operation. And the idea we would come out of the sun at high speed, slow up, go right past. You see the open door there. And the head of Cambodia was in there having a super secret meeting with the communist uh, people. And we would be snapping uh, photos or whatever just to let them know we know you're here. Don't make the deal. And that was the mission. This is the photo that I took. We were almost, the wheels are almost on the roadway in between the two buildings. It was some very ballsy flying by Captain uh, Doherty. And it says there was two Irish guys in a SOG airplane. And uh, who knows what they're going to do. Doherty has a book that's about to be published, and I think, what is it, The uh, Only the Light Changes, I think, and it's supposed to come out any time now, but he was a very, very courageous, uh, all of our aviators were amazing, but this is an example, this was a very classic off-the-wall mission. Here you're seeing, uh, it's a little hard to see right here, this is a bamboo roof, and 
there are actually communications lines in it. These are impenetrable from high up, could never see these. And so here you're down below the treetops, you're shooting in at an angle and you're identifying what type of structures they have where, which will tell you where their facilities are that are worth striking or else worth monitoring or possibly even putting a team on the ground on the target. So that's when you're actually seeing it, but it gives you some feeling for uh, how low these photo missions were done. A lot of the airplanes got shut up. Here is on the, in a truck park that uh, we had located. This is one of their trucks. Uh, American fighters had been, we guided them in and they just started ripping the place up and you will see some uh, different areas. It's a little hard here, but you'll see a little black dot there. That's a bunker entry because they blast it really hard. F4s, A1Es, uh, all kinds of uh, things. They, uh, they do some real damage. This is the white stuff is cargo that had been blown up where the truck had been hit. The next one here, the next photo, uh, we had caught an NVA troll in the open going through uh this is an area that had just had an airstrike and their their troops as we we swung around for it i was leaning out the window with my car 15 we have to go back to that and uh, on the first pass i was because the bird dogs were unarmed basically and i was using a car 15 and shooting them up and so they had fled the patrol into the jungle this is a north vietnamese officer and he was wounded and he had his pistol out and he couldn't leave because he was shot in the leg. So we were coming around as we took this for the second shot. And unfortunately, that did not, the story did not end well for him because he was on the other side. I always had respect, though, for their troops because they fought really hard. And uh, there were soldiers serving their country. Um, it's funny, 50 years later to see it. Here's an example uh, where you're seeing, uh, it may be hard with the resolution, there are the wires that you see. This is one of these uh, Snoopy the dog uh, and the Red Baron things. It's on patrol. And the only time you could see these communication wires that mark major enemy units were right at sunrise and right at uh, sunset. And it didn't work at sunset because you'd have to fly back over the Anamese Cordillero in, Cordillera in uh, 5,000 foot high mountains at in the dark. But we'd be out there in the morning and you'd see this. You'd track them to their source. But within an hour or two, you had almost unlimited uh, air support. Um, the way that it worked for SOG, when you came into SOG for recon operations, they gave you a set of code words. And those code words, if you knew those words, you had command authority over any air assets in Southeast Asia. If they had a B-52, when you contacted an Air Force FAC with the right code, they knew whoever knows this code, you do what they say. You don't ask questions, you follow orders. And they say, we have a target uh, in denied territory. What ordinance do you have available? They might say, okay, we have eight B-52s that are inbound from Guam. They're about 70 minutes out. So, okay, we'd like three of them. Here are the coordinates for the strike. That was it. There was no justification. It was just simply change the targeting on three, and they would go ahead. And so after one of the strikes, Frank Greco took this picture, and it shows half a dozen fresh graves that they've just buried the people from one of our attack airstrikes. And you see, by doing the four drum attacks like that, it saved quite a few uh, recon lives because we were losing so many of those. And yeah, that was a problem. I mean, um, there was a guy that they decided to put him in the photo lab. I did not particularly care a great deal for him, but he outranked me. I ran the photo lab. And I had told them, look, uh, this target you want to do tomorrow is a very dangerous target. How about if I do it? And you can kind of work your way into the hard targets. And, say, and he said, no, no, I, I'm going to do it. I don't need help. 
I said, look, you don't understand. If you try and do a second pass, you will not survive. You will not survive. You're, you're, you're fortunate if you make it through the first pass. The, the uh, area is so heavily gunned and defended. A second pass, you will die. You need to understand that. And he didn't listen, and he talked the pilot into by kind of pleading because he didn't get the photos on the first. That's what I wanted to train him at. And he talked him into doing a second pass, and he did not survive the experience. So I'm not trying to be critical of a brave man. He was brave, but he didn't want to listen to me because he outranked me. And uh, But he was very brave, and he died serving his country. Uh, but second passes were not normally survivable. The first time, for example, they would, uh, by using rudder, act, they would fly the airplane partly sideways. And when their gunners are sighting it, they think that you're going a little differently than you're really going. And that's enough that uh, the, the super heavy tracer fire, and it often goes just beside the airplane. But sometimes it's going through it. And... Uh, it's brisk. It's invigorating. Um, what can I say? But these aviators were just phenomenal pilots, and they were very, very brave Americans serving their country, like uh, just so many of the people. God bless them. Anyway. Um, well, we've uh, we've almost gone for two and a half hours, if you can believe it, Mr. Okay. Mike. Uh, I was going to say, uh, you're, you're such a well knowledge. Uh, uh, we covered some of your your group on uh, mission in the course. We got into some of your other details, but there's a lot of stuff that left to cover if you'd like to cover, but we'd love to have you back to talk solve history if you, if you enjoy coming back uh, with us. Today. That's fine. I, I really appreciate everybody that's, that's here that's interested in what people did back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and uh, the early myths of time and uh, and bud thank you for what you're doing to memorialize this because our generation is passing uh i know i don't look a day over 30. it's all the clean living but uh, i'm about to hit 74 and so our generation is fading and there's a new and a wonderful generation that is there and uh, i just thank god for everybody that loves this great nation of ours so thank Absolutely. you all for being here. We we can't thank you enough. We've had, I mean, uh, I can't wait to see the numbers off the list, but uh, we've had a record of uh, participation and viewers during the thing. It was in between 25 and 30 active viewing and people commenting. Um, we're getting a bunch of thank yous coming in. I'll be passing those on because they'll be coming in. But uh, Mr. Mike, uh, I'll stay in touch with you and uh, We'll set another day up for you to come back. Is there anything else before we go that you'd like to lay out for the for the crowd before we end for the day? Uh, just the basic philosophical question of the universe. Um, why did somebody put an S in the word lisp? Because that was pretty mean. But I'll leave that you guys with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. God well. God bless you, sir. And we'll, uh, you just hit the leave studio button and uh, I'll touch base with you here in a little while. And you'll be good to go. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, guys, we had a wonderful, wonderful guest. I uh, was worried we weren't going to get Mr. Mike on. Uh, we were facing some technical difficulty issues uh, early on, and I was really, really nervous that we weren't going to have it uh, work out. Uh, so, um, I, I, it, it was just amazing. I told y'all he, uh, he is the information story man. He, uh, he, he is, he's one of my all time favorite songs, man, to, to talk to. Uh, I've known him for a year or two now. Um, and he's by far one of the uh, most knowledgeable men. And not to mention, he didn't mention this, and I'll mention it for him. I hope he doesn't get mad at me, but, uh, he, uh, he uh uh is a Mensa member. He's got a uh he won't like it, but he's a a a, a, a fisher, uh, he's a genius. He's a, a Mensa member. He's a, IQ's over one thirty. That's why he brought that up earlier. Um, so we got a we got a great uh resident solid historian to come in and sit with us. So uh, 
I'm uh, I'm just glad we were able to get this one worked out and going. Uh, now I've got to remember we've got John Ball and Cliff Newman uh, to work through some audio issue. And I hate to say it, I'm thinking it's uh, like Terry messed up and had his phone on. I think Mr. Cliff had his on and it was messing up the interface between the two. So uh, they both said they're still uh, on the schedule and ready to come on when we can get it ironed out. So uh, let's uh, let's just enjoy the two and a half hours of song awesomeness we just sat through and uh, got to got to really enjoy. I hope y'all enjoyed it as much as I do. I, uh, some of these stories I had not heard and some of them I have, have but I absolutely love hearing and sharing the history of not only Special Forces, but SOG in Vietnam. I mean, uh, you can't really ask for a better guy like him. He's kind, humble as hell, and uh, knows his history. So, um, and Zero Mike Fox, I'm going to be prodding him to see about writing a book because he more has more than enough to write a book. Uh, we could probably sit down and do like Blaster and do two. Uh, on, on the saw history and his service. But uh, I'm going to wrap it up here before we hit it even two hours and 30 minutes, guys. We've had a wonderful day. Uh, we, let's just thank Mr. Mike. I'll uh, pass along a thank you to him. And uh, y'all got, you guys did great. Thank you for the participation today. Uh, without y'all, we wouldn't have the guests. The show wouldn't be flowing like it is. And then and is in good as show as it is it going. We're uh, over 330 subscribers now. Uh, Colonel Walkoff's first video was about the past 3,000 views. Um, all of the videos are, are now 300 and above. Uh, some grow more than others, which is uh, to expect. You know, some people have their favorites, and that, that's that's okay. Uh, but it's uh, it's taking off unbelievably. So. Thank y'all for what y'all are doing. Um, and I'm going to be getting the Patreon set up this week to where we can, uh, A, travel to some people that aren't able to set up on the internet, like Mr. Rudy Sayer, who I've been speaking to, but uh, also help me get the audio so set up to where we don't have any more issues. So, uh, yeah, he is a, he, he is a genius. <laughs> um, so I hope y'all had fun learning about Ford Drum. I've been wanting to get some info out to y'all to where y'all could see uh, stories about him and Mrs. Frank Doherty. And that's going to be a book y'all are going to need to buy to hear about that story literally flying at rooftop level in between the alleys to take pictures of the NBA in both France meeting. How about that? Uh, well, I will uh, be in touch with y'all later on today. Uh, y'all be good. And thank y'all for an awesome day. It's been absolutely, absolutely awesome. I, I'm speechless. Just uh, thank y'all so much and have a good rest of y'all's evening.